The city of Königsberg was the location of one of World War II's most brutal engagements. Being one of the crown jewels of Hitler's fortress strategy, which demanded every single village, town and city be defended to the last man, and to make the attacking Soviets have to take through Dirch Fressen by letting his blood flow. So let's explore how this siege unfolded. Königsberg was an extremely important city to the Germans, as it was a historical and strategically vital city, due to the fact it was designed as a fortress, and the loss of it would be felt in every German's heart. The Soviet commanders knew this, and no matter what the cost, the city would have to fall. By January 1945, the Red Army had ploughed through the East Prussian territories, and had caused massive casualties on the German forces, but also received huge casualties as well. And on the 28th of January, they stood only 10 kilometres away from the city's outer perimeter. But to the German surprise, they did not advance, and instead surrounded the city and cut off its supply lines. The Russians knew this would be a difficult fight, and began their preparations for the siege. Now the Germans inside Königsberg knew the inevitable Russian assault would be coming. They began the recruitment of emergency units and local Hitler youth forces were scoured for military able children and immediately all the city's workshops began to repair all German military vehicles as a priority. And by February 17th the units formed were placed under the control of the fortress commander General Otto Lasch who quickly got them to work improving on Königsberg's already heavy defences. And as this force joined the garrison, the German high command deemed this suitable to defend the city and launched a risky gambit to open up a corridor to Königsberg. Codenamed Westwind, on the 19th of February, the Germans launched an attack on the Russian 39th Army, which was exhausted from months of combat. And it was a massive success, with the corridor being opened and fresh supplies could now reach the city. From February until late March, the Soviets began the mass stockpiling of troops, armour and supplies needed to take Königsberg. Everyone knew this would be a bloodbath and the Russian commanders had to use every advantage possible to be ready for the formidable defences. Aerial reconnaissance was the first major advantage with multiple recon missions detailing everything viewable of the city and its fortifications, and the Russians then having a 36 square metre electrical relief model of Königsberg and its defences constructed to study German positions in depth. The Russians were not taking any chances. Next they had the Russian Navy blockade and mine the waterways around Königsberg to stop the evacuation via sea and to block any reinforcements from arriving from the sea. While the Russians prepared, the German forces and 130,000 civilians were being pressed into work gangs to make sure they had every bit of the city ready for the hordes of Russian troops. During this time, court martials and executions were high as SS and Nazi party members had to enforce their control over the population and low morale soldiers. But even with these harsh conditions, they had a few luxuries like cinemas and bars being open and thanks to the reopened corridor, food was plentiful, a small mercy for the defenders. But even with the fortifications, which consisted of 19th century fortresses in an outer perimeter ring, and a huge amount of trenches interlinking them, there were simply too few men to hold the city for what was coming. In total, the Germans had 47,800 men, which were from battered and tired infantry regiments, and around 5,000 of these troops were waltzed with no experience whatsoever. They also had 224 artillery pieces, with a mix of tanks and assault guns consisting of less than 100 as I can tell. There was also a shortage of artillery shells, meaning the Russians built their forces to assault the Germans and they could do nothing with their artillery and had to just wait until their main assault attack would arrive. As April 1st arrived, so did the Soviet quiet. The artillery bombardment of the city began with some 5,000 guns and mortars and 300 rocket launchers pounding the city with every shell and rocket they had. The bombardment tore through the streets, blasting to bits all but the strongest defences and making it near impossible for the defenders to move without risk of death. And the guns kept up this whole storm until April the 6th. The ground forces then began to move in, with men of the 11th Guards Army crawling under the cover of the artillery, right up to the fortress defences, and as soon as the guns stopped, they advanced with heavy fighting following. It was carnage, but the Russians had the advantage in troops, tanks, artillery and air support. The Germans, even though determined, could only delay the wave of enemy forces. The Russian forces made progress and the Germans, even though holding on to some vital fortress strongholds, were being pushed back and surrounded, and now with the weather clearing up, some 2,500 Soviet aircraft began their support of their brothers on the ground, increasing the pressure on the Germans. And by the end of the 6th of April, the Soviets had made considerable progress and even broken some of the fortress strongholds, with one being destroyed by SU-122 self-propelled guns firing directly at the walls to shatter its pieces. The 7th of April began with another bombardment, this time it was short and intense, and once again the ground forces began their advance further into the city. The Germans put up stiff resistance, began to do a fighting retreat further into the defences, causing high casualties on the Soviet forces, 
but they could not stem the tide. The Soviets attempted to cut the Germans off from the railway lines that led into the city. This was a brutal affair, with the battle lasting until the afternoon on the 8th, with both sides taking heavy losses. But even with this brutal resistance, the Soviets once again made progress but at a slower pace. Still, the news was tightening and there was no way the German forces would be able to escape. The 8th of April began and the Soviet forces' priority was to link up all their attack elements before finally pushing into the centre areas of Konigsberg. The Germans attempted at all costs to stop these link-ups, but they did not have the forces to conduct effective counter-attacks, and the Soviet forces combined together. Now moving at a slow but steady pace, they had the centre areas completely encircled. Immediately, Soviet commanders had leaflets dropped on the city to urge German troops and civilians to surrender, but very few did. The remaining German forces did attempt to break out of the city, but due to this being conducted at night with the city around them ruined, it made navigation difficult and caused the soldiers to split up and attack the Soviets piecemeal, with no success, and the civilians who had followed helping to escape were also killed in the fighting. On the 9th of April, the remaining German forces were boxed into the last line of defences. Comprising of 19th century forts, they held only 4 kilometres squared of territory, with no ammunition or supplies left. And no chance to escape, the German commander, General Otto Latch, decided he must surrender to save the lives of his men and the civilians. Peace Army boys were sent to meet with the Soviets, but Nazi party members shot them and attempted to arrest the officer General Otto Latch had tasked with this mission. Eventually, they were able to calm the Nazi party members, and surrender terms were agreed, and at 10.45pm, the remaining Germans had surrendered to the Soviet forces. But some 150 men of the Kampfrug Skrupert refused this, and with one of their own officers, occupied the old castle Konigsberg, and chose to fight to the last man, which the Soviets granted by then killing them all. The Siege of Königsberg proved two key things. Firstly, that even a diminished and understrength force with the right defences could hold off a vastly superior force, and in this case did so for two months. And also, that with the right preparation and use of forces, even a mighty fortress city of Königsberg could fall far quicker than expected. The fighting in Königsberg was exceptionally brutal, and the soldiers of both sides showed bravery and determination that deserves our respect and admiration. I hope you enjoyed this video, thank you for watching, and I hope you had a fantastic night.